it wasn't for their sacrifices, such as folks like your president, John Garland, who was, um, I, I just spent about 10 minutes with, with him, and I already know that you are extremely, extremely fortunate to have a man like him at the helm of this university, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors, as you told me this is your, your last, last year. So it was a pleasure meeting you. And I want to thank all the other elders in the room at this moment, because as I, as I said before, this is um, something that would be possible without their contributions. And secondly, I want to thank Ms. Stephanie Craw and Latasha Brown, because it's been their due diligence and hard work behind. This is, this is just game time. We're about to, we're about to you know, start the game. But behind the scenes, they've been putting in the practice, the practice that we see professional athletes that we don't see professional athletes see the finished product on game day or Super Bowl day. And uh, Stephanie Craw and Natasha Brown um, have played a major role in, in helping to bring me here on campus and dotting on the I's and crossing on the T's in terms of making sure that my stay has, has been as comfortable as possible. And I feel quite at home here in the Midwest, quite at home here in Wilberforce, Ohio. So I want to thank all of them. And if we could give them a round of applause. For their Last but not least, I want to thank you, the students. I want to thank the institution, most importantly, because the institution, if there's one thing I want you to remember throughout my talk, it's critical thought. And we need to be looking at building institutions, continue to build institutions. Institutions that long, long, long beyond the Solomon Conference John, or John Garland. It's institutions like Central State that go on. Once the mission is set, is the set board, then it is people that come into these institutions that help enhance it but it's institutions that we have to look at building. So I want to thank Central State and all the students that are in this audience right now, and the ones that are not in this audience, as well as the community members and everyone that supports the uh, ongoing process of continuing to um, ensure that Central State remains uh, the, high, um, the, the high level of academics that, uh, you know, that I can see just from meeting these young men that, that I ate dinner with last night this crowd and so many other folks that it, it puts forth. So that being said, let's get started. It's, it's game time and I'm going to do this because I, I get a little emotional and so I may walk out a little bit. So let me know if my voice projects. I try to make sure that my voice projects but sometimes it's hard for me to stay behind a podium. So we're going to start off by looking at Black History Lifetime. Black History Lifetime is something that I've come to celebrate, to see that Black History Lifetime, and it's the work of the great Dr. Carter G. Woodson, all right, with Negro History Week that brings us here today. But I want you to understand this, okay? I want you to understand this loud and clear that Dr. Carter G. Woodson never intended for the study of black history to stay within the confines of Africans, all right? We have many American born Africans in, in this room, all right, but never wanted to stay within the confines of contributions that American-born Africans uh, contribute to global society, American society. But you need to also be pushing yourself every single year, every single day when you explore black history, explore the great Kwame Nkrumahs, Patrice Lumumba's, obviously the Ida B. Wells, looking at the continent of Africa, looking at Queen Nahanda, Queen Anne and Zenger. Look at those contributions because those contributions are not, are not mutually exclusive to the struggles that were going on right here in the U.S. and throughout the Western Hemisphere. Because as we know, that while folks were fighting for their liberation here, fighting to get the horrendous, barbaric um, chains of shadow slavery off their back, and then fighting for another hundred years to do away, to, to exterminate um, Jim Crow, we had Africans on the continent and other parts of the world that were trying to free themselves of the oppression of colonization. All right, so. And, and it was the work of, of American born Africans, so called African Americans, right here that inspired South Africans, that inspired the Zanians, while they were fighting the brutal reign of, of, of white supremacist apartheid in South Africa. They were inspired by those folks that were fighting here. And that's, you know, that's where we see the black conscious movement with Steve Beagle. So I, I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind. So we look at, we cover Carter G. Woodson, and uh, thank you for your introduction. I love the fact that you incorporated Carter G. Woodson and his body of work and, and history, and obviously there can be entire 
forces taught around cards and whistles, body of work. Negro History Week, we looked at 1996 and 1976 to establish Black History Month. And when I, when I said that I want you to hold on to, if there's one thing that you hold on to that I, that I want you to want to remain with you before I leave, it's critical thought. And I want you to look at that quote right there. That's from Miss Education of Negro. If you have not read that book, read it tomorrow. Start reading it tomorrow. It is as relevant in 2012 as it, it was in the 1920s when he wrote that book. All right. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. When somebody controls your thinking, when you, have the, when you, when you are unable to critically think for yourself, anybody can sell you a bag of goods that is not in your best interest and you will eat it up and you will continue and you will imbibe this dangerous mental poison as if it was yours. You need to push yourself to critically think, challenge information. If there is anything that is new to you, during this, this lecture, if there's anything new to you, make sure you take out your pen, make a mental note of it, and look it up. Challenge all the new information that you get. Because some people that give you new information, it's not factual. All right? Everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but everyone's not entitled to their own facts. So hold on to that. I want to begin by also giving homage to one of my uh, inspirations as a great Marcus Messiah Garvey, who is the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. To this day, there has never been a larger mobilization and galvanization of, of, of people of African descent the world over. Tens of millions of, of African people from the Caribbean, where I'm from, from Trinidad, all the way to Louisiana, which had the, the most chapters of any UI, uh, any state that, that, that had the UNIA in it, um, all the way to Europe. And the continent. And this is a man that never stepped foot on the continent for various reasons. All right, but he was the greatest inspiration to, to me. Now I should have learned about Carlos Wilson in the classroom. I should have, but I didn't. I didn't learn about him in the classroom. This kind of information was purposely. I don't want to say it was accidentally. It was purposely, methodically left out of the pages of American history that I studied when I got to the U.S. from middle school, or I should say elementary school to middle school to high school and even most college classrooms. All right, but Marcus Messiah Garvey is American history. He is world history. Black history is world history. It is American history. We've been taught to think that it's off here and then it's over here. But no, 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 no. A place that is, that is responsible for, for producing religion, philosophy, chemistry, mathematics, sciences, where Europeans came and studied study at a time where the, the, the whole cons uh, conception of, of race did not exist, and looking at somebody and calling them the N-word or calling them something else did not exist, they went and they truly really studied these places called mystery schools, which is just another name, is what commands, what you would call the ancient Egyptians, called their universities and their schools. They studied there freely. So Hippocrates, just to give you a little example, we'll get more into this, during the master's class I'll be teaching, I hope as many of you guys can come in and uh, uh, try partake in that as possible because with only half an hour I can't get, I can't even touch the tip of the iceberg in terms of what I want to touch. But just to give you an example, those of you that, how many people are going on to get their medical degree or going on to get their uh, PhD in psychology? Just by show of hands. Okay. When you go, when you, when you all will, I'm, I'm quite certain will achieve that dream and that goal. When you go, you will undoubtedly, undoubtedly have to raise your hand and you'll have to take the Hippocratic Oath. And what's the Hippocratic Oath? When you finish that goal of being a doctor, you will have to take the Hippocratic Oath. And that goes back to Hippocrates, who was a great doctor of Greece. He's known as the father of medicine, period. The father of medicine, period. But you want to know a little secret that they don't want to tell you? You want to know a little secret that folks don't want to tell you? Is that Hippocrates wrote in his own hands. I've read it. His own words spoke on how inspired he was by somebody by the name of Imhotep. Now, Imhotep, the real father of medicine, pre existed Hippocrates by over a thousand years. This was a black African in Kemet who was not only a doctor, a physician, but he was also an architect. He was a philosopher. He's responsible for being the architect of, the, uh, of um, uh, King Zodozer's Great Pyramid. Okay? 
So you don't take the the, the Imhotep in the oath, you take the Hippocratic oath. So this is, the, this is one of those examples that I want you to, 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 to think about and to understand. That if you are not delving into your own history, if you're not delving into world history, and that's the way, if you, go every, if you ever get a chance to go to the continent, you'll see that the African way of teaching history and things is an interconnectedness, connecting the rest of the world to the continent of Africa. Okay? So I want you to understand that. The next time you think about steel, you look at a piece of steel, and you understand the first people that smelted iron ore into steel, they looked a lot like many of us in this room today. Yes, they were black Africans. Black history did not begin with shadow slavery. One of those things that coming to the U.S., and I think that that was one of the great things that, that gave me a different perspective, is that coming to the U.S. at 10 years of age, black history started with with, 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 with shadow slavery. And still, that there, there are professors on university campuses, like mine, University of Maryland, that will start black history with shadow slavery. And I'm not saying that they all have bad intentions. Some of them were just, you know, residual effects of a system that taught them, or did not teach them about African history, that taught them that, that, taught them that black history started with shadow slavery. No, no, no. It's an important part of our history that we, that must be taught. Just like people of the Jewish faith will tell their young children, never forget the Holocaust. You must never forget child slavery. You must never forget colonization. You must never, ever, ever forget Jim Crow. But don't think that your history started with that. It didn't. Origins of civilization, civilizations I spoke before. Imhotep, father of medicine. He was an architect, philosopher, metaphysician. You call it hieroglyphics. This is an example. The Europeans came, the Greeks, they renamed it hieroglyphics. So everyone in here should know what hieroglyphics is. But that is a Greek term. The ancient Egyptians referred to that as metoneta, the words of God. They came before Columbus. The great Abu Bukhari II, who was related to Mansa Musa, studied, he, not studied, but he sailed, sailed fleets of ships, of hundreds of men, over into the so-called New World. As we know, New World to who? We know that for tens of thousands of years there were indigenous people living everywhere from Nova Scotia all the way down to Argentina. Okay? But he came here 700, at least 700 years before Christopher Columbus. Before Christopher Columbus came and brought a wrath, of fury, and hell, um, and brought a holocaust on indigenous people in places like Hispaniola, um, where we see AT. Otherwise, it was Haiti and the Dominican Republic, where Christopher Columbus did some brutal, him and his men did some brutal things. So it's, it's really, really telling us a society that we're still celebrating um, somebody who was a rapist, a murderer, and a plunder, which is what Christopher Columbus was, um, celebrating him every second Monday of, of, uh, of October. And I'm not being controversial, folks. So if anyone in this room is, oh my gosh, this guy's right, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. You've been sold something where anybody in here that is a human being, which we all are human beings, no one should celebrate anybody with the likes of Hitler, and no one should be celebrating the likes of Christopher Columbus for the hell that they brought to human beings here. So we look at Christopher Columbus, we talk about Abu Bakari, we look at the North African influence in Southern Europe, we look at the African presence throughout Asia, there are African people, there are over a million people of African descent, um, direct African lineage in India, known as the Dravidians, or the Dalits. In the Philippines, we see the Atta, we see the Moran Asni, you know, some, um, in places like Malaysia as well, as well as the Philippines, African presence throughout Europe. Do you know that the father of Russian literature to this day, you go to Russia, the father of Russian literature is a man of African descent, known as Alexander Pushkin. Okay? He is the father of Russian literature. Yes. Many, many slave revolts. And this is why slave, shadow slavery is also taught improperly because far too many instructors don't, you know, they sell you this thing and make it seem like, oh, wow. You know, it seems like, uh, you know, the man, and, you know, they, they just loved it, man. They just, they just loved being on that, they loved being on, on that, uh, that plantation. Well, the truth is, there are hundreds of, of, of slave revolts. Africans re revolted and resisted shadow slavery every step of the way. Yes, there were ones that became domestic.
domesticated, and that was the, that was the part. Yes, they, they were supposed to be domesticated like we domesticate dogs and cats to buy into it, to, to, to believe that that's your lot in life, is to be right down there being treated like, like being treated subhuman. And as we know in this country, one time we were considered less than a human being. But the truth of the matter is there were slave revolts, there was still a rebellion, there were revolts in places like Brazil where, they, where these escaped Africans created their own nation within a nation called the Nation of Palmares and Quilambos. You look at the Cimarrones and the Maroons in Jamaica. You know, these are slave revolts that happened. And look at those people that want to go into journalism. From the beginning of Reconstruction to the beginning of the 1900s, there were no less than 250 independent black newspapers, from the California Eagle all the way to the New, to the, uh, New Amsterdam News in New York City. There are no less than 250 independent newspapers, black newspapers. 104 independent black boarding schools prior to 1954, and with the, with the achievements of uh, Brown versus Board of, Board of Education, it was good to a certain extent because yes, it was segregated, but at the same time, I will tell you this first and foremost, that segregation is only good if the integrity is, along, is allowed to bring in his or her um, social mores and values. That wasn't the case. Oh yeah, you can integrate, you can integrate, black child, you can integrate, but no, 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 you're not going to be getting, you're not going to be getting uh, black history, you're not going to be getting information about your heroes and she -hos. No, 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 no. Uh uh. No, you'll be learning about George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson, both. If you didn't know George Washington owned 370 slaves, so very much so. If we could snap our fingers and go back to the time of George Washington, those things you guys want to, um, you know, put him on a high pedestal. You put him back. You know, put any of us, most of us in this room, back at that time, uh, most likely we'd be snatched up and working on plantations just like the one he had. He owned over 317 slaves. African slaves. You look at Margaret Scarvey, you and I in 1914, and some of the great names, Ida B. Wells, women, women, women played a major role. Right there, that African queen right there, Harriet Tubman, that African queen was as strong as any man in the struggle. And I want you to see that. That is one of my favorite quotes of all time because it is so applicable today. She said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if I could only convince them slaves. They only knew that they were slaves. Think about that. And so for those men that sometimes try to say, oh, I'm going back. This is too much for me. This is under my way. I'm, just, I'm trying to go back. Go ahead. Try it. I'm going to put some, I'm put some lead in your back. Um, they, and they thought twice about it. Because they, she knew if they went back, that would lead a direct beeline to them. Um, and those folks that she was trying to free. So well, let's get to hip-hop. Hip-hop is not a musical genre. I just want to let put it out there. So if you refer to hip-hop as music, then you must please at the very least say hip-hop music. But hip-hop, the thing that you listen to on the radio that you see visually, you turn to a Viacom, anyone at Viacom stations, BET, MTV, which we'll, we'll break down and fan of those stations and whatsoever, but they are our own uh, Viacom. What you see in here is rhythm and poetry. Rap is an acronym for rhythm and poetry. So hip-hop is a culture comprised of various um, various elements, such as, as rap, graffiti, beatboxing, knowledge of self community. Tell me, the, tell me the, the, the last time you saw BET or MTV talking about and pushing. If you're into hip hop, you must be into knowledge of self and knowledge of community. No, no, no. Because you know what? They need you to be mindless consumers. They need you to be as, as non-critical thinking as possible. Because critical thinkers, as I was telling That's true. Dr. Carl last night, critical thinkers don't make good mindless consumers. They need you to go there and say, oh man, I saw the Young Jeezy video. Oh, I gotta get those, I gotta get those sneakers, I gotta get a 16th and 17th pair of sneakers, I gotta get a pair, I gotta get some new rims. I don't own a car, but I gotta get some rims. You know, that, that's the kind of mindless stuff that goes on all the time. Right? But hip hop has always been about knowledge of self and community. When I came up, there's two things I gravitated towards in the U.S. and that was basketball and hip hop. Hip hop just pulled me in. It spoke to me in a way that no one else beside my mom was speaking to me. So I got so much in it. If it wasn't for hip hop, I am not here today. This is what hip hop means to me. Culture, community, innovation, fellowship, activism, good times, rhymes, beats, and all of that. Activism probably being the most important to me this day. 
the stages of hip hop, the evolution, started in the early 70s. If you look at the early 70s, the beginning was an outlet for urban youth, mostly blacks and Latinos in New York City, South Bronx, and it spread all the way to the West Coast. Now we see it's a global phenomenon. We look at the golden era, which produced folks like me. That's when I, I came, really came to, to being. That was when I was to go ahead and to date myself. I was very, very young and, uh, and impressionable. I had a very nascent mind. But thank goodness the images that I was getting from hip hop at that time uh, were about empowerment, social activism, culture. And there was a heightened consciousness of rap music, which led to an increased uh, increase youth activism. This thought was fomenting the listeners of uh, hip hop music. And then we have today, hip hop is very young. We have the corporate black explosion. Mainstream rap becomes more diluted, less politically engaged, more sexist. And that's two kinds of work. Hip hop, in many ways, corporate hip hop, in many ways, is misogynistic, which is the hatred of women. So, young sisters out there, when you listen, don't, don't, don't try to make excuses for the music. Just like young brothers, when you're hearing stuff that um, should not fly, and it's talking about senseless violence, especially if you're hearing rappers talk about women, senseless violence. All right, you know, don't make excuses for the music. Don't make excuses. Reclaim your mind. Reclaim your mind. Because until you stop accepting that stuff, the artists, and more importantly, the record labels, the false white record, uh, record labels that control it, will continue to push forward that kind of stuff. So we're looking at hip hop, I just wanted to kind of connect hip hop to African history. We looked at the Grio, which is an African storyteller, mostly in the west coast of Africa. But even today, in places like Senegal, the, the Grio is used. We see uh, the Grio using poetic license to tell stories within the community. We look at Metanetra, which is otherwise known as hieroglyphics. And I like that, and that's the storytelling. And early hip hop, uh, hip hoppers, especially graffiti artists, they were telling stories. So in New York City, and so now, yes, it's very much illegal as it was then. So I'm not advocating that. But if you look at cities like Philadelphia, where they hire local um, graffiti artists to, to draw on the, the buildings of projects and tenements to, beautif to beautify them. But back then, you were talking about New York City youth in Philadelphia, where Philadelphia is actually where modern day hip hop graffiti started. But they were marginalized, they were cast off. Society didn't want nothing to do with these black and brown youth. They didn't want nothing to do with them. So, if young brother, you know, Jose Hernandez was shot and killed in New York, you would have somebody come and go into the ghost yards and tag on, on a pristine That's white train. Rest in peace, Jose Hernandez. And that train made its way throughout the city, which, in essence, was a moving social mural. So you saw it in the Bronx, you saw it in Brooklyn, you saw it in Manhattan, you saw it throughout the city in one day. Beatboxing. Many of you, as I can see, are, are in fraternities, so you have an appreciation for stepping. And so, if you have an appreciation for stepping, you must look at handbone, which is a precursor to that. And you must look at, you look and looking at beatboxing, which is a part of hip hop today, which is the making of, uh, manipulating your mouth and sometimes your body to create beats. But when we look at handbone, going back to Africans, one of the first things that they needed to do to domesticate kidnapped Africans who were brought over here throughout the so-called the world was to take away your culture. And as is today, as back then, the drum was a major part of African culture. Today, if you go to Ghana, if you go to some other parts of Africa, you will see that the drum is used as a connection to the ancestors, a connection to the ancestors who have made their transition to the heavens. So they took away their drums, but these ingenious Africans, what do they do? It's okay to take our drums, it's going to be on the plantation. True. And they started to mimic the sound of the drums by being in the chest. And the women and the men would sing along. That's the kind of power, that's the kind of stock that many of us come from. And matter of fact, all of us come from. Because the original man was an African man. So whether you, you have a black, melanin, uh, okay, 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 you disagree with me. Um, whether, whether you're white, Latino, what happened? The original man and woman is from Africa. And the original societies were mixed up. That means they were led by women. Led by women. Women, the original societies on planet Earth were matriarchal. Understand that. So we look at some of the issues discussed really quickly that were discussed in the Golden Era when I was coming up. Rampant police brutality, uh, poverty. We, and we know, hey, 
2012, we're, we're not immune to police brutality anymore. It seems like uh, police brutality um, only makes its way to uh, black and brown communities. But we see even in 2010, a seven-year-old black girl from Detroit, Michigan, named Ayanna Stanley Jones was shot by the police. All right, shot she laid on her couch um, and killed a seven-year-old black girl that most of the nation did not know anything about. Why? Because it's been institutionalized. Because even with my own students, I have to check them all the time. And I tell them about something. And the way they've been programmed, I tell them about a young brother who's been killed by the police. And their first reaction is, oh, what do you do? What do you do? So they're automatically given the benefit of the doubt all the time to the police officer. But in these cases, these individuals, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, Oscar Grant, Timothy Stansbury, Patrick Dorsman, um, Adolf Grimes, do I need to go on? I can go on forever. This is why I teach. I can go on for another half hour naming names, right? Of unarmed black and brown men who have been killed by the police. This was an issue as it is now in the golden era. And this is what artists spoke about. This is what they spoke about. The military industrial complex. All right, we have a government that continues to spend a trillion dollars a year on military purposes. Meanwhile, 44,000 Americans every single year by Harvard universities, if we need to have some validation, by Harvard universities report that they put out two years ago, die every single year because of lack of health insurance. 44,000 people a year die because they have no health insurance. These are things that were discussed in the great Martin Luther King, and I bet you, and I'm just saying this in the challenge out there, most of you in here don't know the same Dr. Martin Luther King that I have. I'm hoping that's not the case, but I think that most of you don't know the same. Because the way he, his life is being taught in America is this, as if he died in 1963 with the March on Washington. He didn't. Some of his most powerful work occurred the next few, few years, until 1968, April 4th, 1968, when he was assassinated. Okay, but that man said things like this in 1967, a year to the day before he was assassinated. Any nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. He said, my nation is the greatest purveyor of violence on the face of the earth. He came to a point, as we know, he was nonviolent. He came to a point where he said, I can no longer go into the inner cities and places like Detroit and tell these black boys, you know, to put down their arms and to choose nonviolence. I sound like a hypocrite when their own nation is using violence, continues to use violence as a, as a first and second and third option throughout the world. He was talking about the Vietnam War. That's Dr. King. That's the man I fell in love with. That's the man I fell in love with. So some of the issues that are discussed in ground music today, yeah. But you know what? They're not playing on BET and TV and where I live in Washington, D.C. They're not playing on 95 or KYS. No, 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 no. They don't want these issues. They, want, they don't want rappers that are black, white, and brown, because there are black, and white, and brown, and Asian rappers who are talking about these kind of things right now today that are supremely talented. But for some reason, they're pushing the underground. And so think about that. Harriet Tubman, she was not going underground. The Underground Railroad was called the Underground Railroad because it was being suppressed by the, the dominant hegemonic uh, uh, hegemonic society at the time. And that was the white society that was, that was oppressing them. So when we look at underground rap, when you talk about underground hip hop, that means it's not underground, it's being suppressed by the dominant corporate media. Mm -hmm. So these issues are discussed today, suppressed. today, by the likes of Gene Gray, Mortal Technique, Dead Prez. Uh, Mr. Liv, I mean, we have to go on and on. Most that Tyler quality, we can go on and on. These are some of the name drops that we heard, that I heard from rap songs when I was growing up, when I was 12, 13, 14. I heard all these names. I learned about Tommy Turret, I learned about the Skokie Carmichael, I learned about Huey Newton, Andrew Davis, all from rap songs that I listened to. This was one of the rap songs that dropped in 1989. This was the, and this is where you see some young brothers talking about what they see in the school system, or I should say what they don't see in the school system. So some of the best practitioners of education have been young brothers and sisters like yourself. My, my forefather was a king. He wore, he wore fat gold chains and, and fat rings. Nobody believes this to be true. Maybe it's because my eyes ain't blue. You're not vaguely find this in your history book. Come here, young blood, take a look. Dig down deep inside this park cover. Don't you know he was my brother? All you read about was slavery, never about the black man's bravery. You look, you look at the pictures and all they show you is African people with bones in their noses. That ain't true, that's a lie. That's a lie. You didn't get that from our lemon pie. 
And the African prophet tells us, until lions tell the tale of the story, the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Yes, indeed. You must now start to tell your own stories. That is why independent media, which I have an independent media outlet, which I am telling every single one of you that cannot make it to the master session, you get in contact with me. My information, my cell phone number is there. I started an independent media outlet in Washington, D.C. to give young people like yourself the opportunity to be citizen journalists, to call in, you can call from anywhere in the country, and we will set up shows dedicated to whatever issues that are going on in your community. And as soon as the show is over, if people can't listen live, it remains an on archive where you can embed it into your blog or Facebook indefinitely. So now we look at the corporate name drop. Chris Dow, no way. Roll it, diamonds. Diamonds, diamonds on my wrist, diamonds on my wrist. All this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> but at the same time, man, not thinking that, you know what? Those diamonds on my wrist, a lot of them come at a cost. There's some, there's some legless and ominous Sierra Leoneans and Congolese. That, that have lost their, their, their lives, and I guess maybe if they're lucky or unlucky, have lost their limbs because of those diamonds. 